or Plan B. <laughs> the heart of the eternal Plan B. Uh, and last class we were looking in John, Gospel of John chapter 6, and we got about halfway through that. <clears throat> and so turn there, if you would, please, with me. John 6, or as we call it in my home country, John 6. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, we were talking last time about verse 26 and 27. I'd like for us to look at 27 through 29. Um, so we're including one of the verses we talked about last time. John 6, 27, labor, labor not for the food which perisheth. And you remember last class we talked about they were laboring for it because they had traveled a long way just to catch up to Jesus <clears throat> at this point. Uh, and in, in, um, uh, in the verse in front of it, Jesus was saying, you're not seeking me properly. Your motives are wrong. So labor not for the food with which perisheth, but for that food which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath the Father sealed. And we were noting in verse 4 of this chapter how the um, Passover was near at hand. And so Jesus decides he's going to give them the true meaning of the Passover. Uh, and if you'll notice, if, as you read through, there is no mention of blood on the doorposts. There is only a mention of blood now, same blood, but now the true meaning that we take inside of us for the life is in the blood. And the lamb that is to be eaten that was the, in the shadow at the Passover where they were killed the lamb, put its blood on the doorpost, then they ate it. The lamb that we are supposed to be eating is the lamb of God, is Jesus, is, is Jesus the broken bread as he's pretty much stuck to up to this point. And then he's going to change it over to um, eat my flesh and drink my blood. So um, then verse 28, then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Okay, so they have they have an idea i mean they remember now they had just eaten bread jesus fed the five thousand they had what they might have called the passover they had what they might have thought was something important um and jesus uh and so now they want to work the works of god but they still have this thing in mind and they don't understand the bread that's before them and they don't understand that what they do understand is uh, where is it where they um, that says that they would come to him. Here it is, verse uh, 15. And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into the mountains. And uh, also, I'm sorry, I'm skip verse 14. Then those men, when they saw the miracle that Jesus did, said, "This is of a truth that prophet that cometh unto the world." Okay, so this is their perception. This is their perception of Jesus. And their perception of Jesus is based on what they want. Y'all remember we discussed that. It's based on what they want. And it's not based on uh, the desire of the Father for sons, and it's not based on the desire of the Son for a counterpart to himself. It is based on their temporal needs. And so they are trying to honor him as this, and Jesus had... At, at hearing this, withdrew, withdrew from them. And um, so now he's going to speak up. <laughs> now he's going to speak up and he's going to start addressing their motives. <clears throat> and he's going to, more, but more important than that, he's going to address the father's motive. <clears throat> and he's going to address his own motive for being there. Okay, so with that, 
frame of mind that they have that Jesus did a miracle, he fed all of us. I mean, you know, let's look at this man, Jesus, as, as people would perceive him. He fed 5,000 without any problem at all. Uh, later on, he raises the dead. He raises Lazarus. I mean, this is, this is kind of a cool king, <laughs> right? I mean, this, this guy can keep us in food without having to pay for it. And, you know, when we get old and die or have an accident and die, he can raise us from the dead. All right, Jesus' mind isn't anywhere near that. His heart is for the satisfaction of the Father that comes through him as the Son to them. Okay. So, and we, we could draw it thusly. Uh, the Father, the Son, and then sons... Uh, and then we could draw that, so the, first, so the first circle is the father, then below it is the son, and then below that is sons. Or we could draw it like this, the father, and I'm only going sideways because I don't want to erase that and go over. The father, the son, and then sons within him, what I, what I termed the pomegranate son in the tabernacle class when I taught years ago. Um, is sons that are in Christ, sons that are sons by Christ, and therefore there is no extension beyond the son. Now that's important. I mean, that, you know, you can hear that and we can just pass on and that's fine. But if you do that, what you're doing is you're passing on past the son being the fulfillment or what it says here, him hath the father sealed. This is it. There ain't no more openings. <laughs> this is sealed. It's going to be in sun or it's not going to be at all. It can't be because the image that the Father wants is the image of the Son. That we, what does it say in Romans 8? That we might be conformed to the image of what? His Son. Okay? So that image is sons or those to the Father. Now remember, we're, we're talking about relating to the Father here, not relating to the Son as bride or wife of the Lamb. And um, so all of the fulfillment for the, fa the Father's heart, his, his deep desire for sons in the image of Christ is all founded upon the Son. And if we don't embrace that, uh, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll see that. I mean, just, just the fact that Jesus says, eat my flesh, what does that mean? Well, that's the, that's the material part. That's the, that is to be him in the flesh. That's the manifestation of drink my blood is the spirit of it, the spirit and life of it. But the manifestation of it is going to come through his flesh. We're his body. Make sense? See? All right. So, uh... So they're saying, verse 28, then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? All right. So they're wanting to sign up. Okay. Now this is, that, this is important. They're wanting to sign up with Jesus, and Jesus, get ready, is about to unleash stuff that's going to chase most of them off. significant and if you don't remember anything else I share in this session remember everything I've said that's a joke but it gives me time to take a drink all right um, the son the, the 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 beloved son who was at one time Jesus to the Father, uh, let's draw this a little differently in this way, okay? So here's the Father, and here's the, uh, the OBS. You didn't know he was an OBS, did you? Only begotten son. <laughs> he was the only 
the only at that time when he walked the earth. Everybody else was, you know, had that disease, ADAM. <laughs> they all had Adam. And so Jesus at that time, he was it. And the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Um, and so you see him, the father saying that, the father, the father, the father, opening heaven, the father ripping back the veil, as it were, and doing one thing, not changing the world, not saying this is the savior, believe in him. He's speaking of his heart toward this son and what it's going to mean. So he sees Jesus here in this, this um, picture of water baptism. And that's when he does it. Well, water baptism represents what? Going down into death and coming up anew. Well, that's what we all do. But, folks, we go down into death in Christ. He doesn't kill us off individually. We are crucified with Christ and raised unto newness of life. Right? That's what it says, Romans 6. So that process to the Father, to the Father, we have to... We have to stop trying to figure out everything based on us and based on the earth and everything. These were eternal desires in the heart of the Father. And he says, this one that is about to go down into death and in type and shadow come up with many sons within him to give the Father back what satisfies his heart. The resurrection for us Jesus, I am the resurrection. If you're going to be a son to the Father, I need to be the resurrection and the life. Okay, but it's the life in nature of that selfless Lamb. See, it's it's it. This belo this remark here has to do with the Son giving Himself, just as we're talking about here, um, which we haven't. We've we've said it in the prior two classes. But we'll speak of it more uh, tonight. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? All right. So can you believe that there are a lot of Christians that believe in God but don't really know the Father? Can you believe that? Yeah. It's true. I know that's shocking. Can you believe that they believe in the Savior but have no clue the nature of Jesus and what links, lengths he would go to to bring about what the Father desired in his heart. Now, if you don't believe that's a fact, you just keep reading John. Read it all the way through and read it over and over. And what you're going to find is over and over, the Son towards the Father, the Father toward the Son, the Son towards the Father, the Father towards the Son. You're going to see this process or this uh, relationship. And you're going to see that this was before the foundation of the world. And you're going to see Jesus when he's in John 17, just before he dies, praying the Father's heart that they may be one even as you and I are one which was that one has been before the foundation of the world so he's trying to get us to enter into um, something that always was uh, and we're trying to just get to heaven or get healed or get fed or, you know, satisfied, meaning fed, satisfied, to get fat, satisfied. And we're using the son more as a prophet and the king, whereas at this point, he's going, we don't even need to be talking about that. That is off bounds. I mean, that's, that's uh, verse 14 and 15, and he's saying, now we're going to talk about the real deal here. We're going to talk about the Father's heart, and we're going to talk about why I'm here, my purpose, why the Father sent me. Next verse. What should we do? I mean, we read, what should we do to do the works? Uh, 
uh, of God. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. All right. So, our understanding of that, generally across the board, as Christians and religionites, is the one he sent was Jesus to die so we wouldn't go to hell. Right? I mean, isn't that the general sort of what? This is the work of God. Look, just believe on me. And our understanding of believe is, is simply, you know, once you believe for salvation, forget it. You don't need to believe anything else about, you know, God anymore, you know. Um, that's, that's the way we think. But we, how do we enter into a relationship with the Father? Only through the Son. But what son? See, because we say, well, it's the son. You know, and you've heard me say, you know, Jesus said, let's see, uh, your shirt right there. Perfect. Would you come up here just one second? Hurry, we only have 10 minutes in this class. Not really. See this shirt? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? So what is our understanding of that? I'm going to leave you up here, and I'm going to... No, not really. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to show you that our, okay, so, so Jesus says, I am the way, and we go, he is the way to salvation. I am the truth. He's the only truth there is. Nobody else is true. He's the life. He, yes, he's the life giver. Uh, 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 and, uh. You know, I am the way. No man comes to the Father. He didn't say heaven. He didn't say salvation. It's in his heart. It's in the heart of the son towards the father. And we keep centering all of this stuff on us and my need. And, my, and, and we have legitimate needs. We have legitimate needs for salvation. We have legitimate needs. But so does the father. So does he. And Jesus is here. And we still hadn't really seen that yet in, in these scriptures. But Jesus is here for that desire and to fulfill that and to help bring that about. So he says, I'm the way to the Father. I am the truth. I am the truth of the Father. I am the fullness of the truth that relates to bringing about what the Father wants. I am the Son whom he hath sealed to this end. And I am the life. The father is wanting sons, folks, but he's just, you know, and again, that's not, that's, has nothing to do with gender. That has to do with the nature toward the father and the relationship towards the father. Um, and, the, and with that, the attitudes and um, heart towards the father. I am the way to the Father, okay. So we've discussed this in time past. How do we see that? Well, we usually see it, I mean, because we, it seems simple enough. I mean, it's a simple enough statement. Well, it's simple enough, I get it. He's the way to the Father. But here's how he's the way to the Father. He's, he's not the way to the Father as if the Father were standing here and you're over there and Jesus is in the middle and he says, and y'all remember, we've done this. I think you were part of that one too. And take, I take the hand of the believer or Jesus takes the hand of the believer and he says, here, Father, I want to introduce you. I, well, and then he turns and says, Jesus, you were the way to the Father. I didn't know how to get there. It was like the directions were crazy. And my GPS wasn't working. Uh, are you serious, Siri? Anyway, so, so that's what we think. Okay, but here's the real deal. The real deal has to do with this thing. This thing. This son will get you to the Father. That's how you go through the cross. You don't, you know... He takes you in all of your wretchedness and in your worst. Now, most of you don't remember your worst. You know, you've come a long way. You don't remember how. But the truth is, you've never realized your worst. 
and I haven't either. And we don't. We don't. We have no clue, you know. Jesus comes up, puts his arms around us, and we go, oh, Jesus, you know, I know I'm a wretch. Thank you for loving me. And he just goes, you don't even know, you know. And we go, well, I'm sure it was bad, but we don't know. We have no clue. But that doesn't matter to him because he's going to do something wonderful. He's going to take you to the cross and put it all to death. How wonderful can that be? And then he's going to put his own life in you and put you in him. And then he's going to be your resurrection and your life. And now you can come, see the arrow back this way now. Now you can come to the Father by broken bread, which is what he's been talking about up to this point. Or poured out blood poured out blood, not just blood, you know, not just pinprick, but the pouring out and the brokenness of his body, broken bread. And so through that, that's the way, that's the way. Christ crucified is the way. Christ crucified is the truth that God wants to refer to, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit want to refer to. And Christ crucified is the life of resurrection. Is that a shocker to anybody? He's the life of resurrection. You say, where do you get that from? Well, I think let's try a revelation of a slaughtered lamb on the throne. What's, he do? What's a slaughtered lamb doing on the throne? If the victory has come, we got the victory, you know? And Jesus shows it. He looks as, and he's, just a, he's not even just a lamb. He's a preemie lamb that is slaughtered. That's the right word. That we, we use the word slain. Somebody used it because they didn't want to offend us and our, our sensitivities. But he's a slaughtered lamb on the throne, and that's what everybody's worshiping. You see that? So, the, the way, the truth, and the life, same slaughtered lamb. And we're not going to get to fa the Father unless that spirit and son is within us. Now you say, well, where do you get that from? Jesus died for me, so I wouldn't have to die. Da, 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 da. The whole thing of John 6 is that he is that, and then he says, eat it. Put it in you, assimilate it, let it become who you are. Yeah. You know, it's like we, we hear the message, but not the call. You know? And when he came with the message, he also came with the call. Okay, so um, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And he's already described, I'm broken bread. And you're wanting miracle bread because you view me as a prophet. And you're wanting protection and healing and everything because you view me as a king. But I view you as what is meant to be the instruments of the Father's satisfaction. In other words, the, the vessels of it, the release of it, the body of it, my flesh, my flesh, my flesh. The body of it, the container, the manifester of it. How about that? The body. The body is the manifest. Whatever's going on in me, I manifest. if I want to manifest it, I do it through my body. You know, I mean, I could be sitting inside going, you know, right now I'm jumping up and down and making funny faces. Well, you would, n you would never know that, but I know it. Anyway, but, uh, but if I manifest it, then you'll know it. Well, on a much more serious note, that reality of the nature of Christ is only going to be manifested through his flesh. We have to eat that and assimilate it and let it become... Uh, life in us, the life of us, but also the manifestation of it. All right, so um, 
This is the work of God, Jesus is saying. You want to know the work of God? Yeah, yeah. You know, when do we start? <laughs> you know? You want to know the work of God? Yes, yes, I want to be involved in ministry. I, I am looking forward to, you know, being famous or, you know, or being useful. I mean, I remember when I was in Bible school and, you know, I just said, Lord, I just want to be used. I mean, I'm, I mean, that was real. It was like, I, and I was so sincere. I just want to be used. And, you know, if I could have heard his voice at that time and I couldn't, he would have said, you know, you really need the cross first. You know, could we talk about the cross? No. <laughs> you know, uh, not, unless it's pertaining only to Jesus, we don't talk about the cross. <laughs> but, but that's his heart, his heart, Jesus' heart is to bring us into what he's about. Do you, can you see that? I mean, and, and if, if he really wanted that, he wouldn't just take somebody and go, okay, I'm going to train you. He's going to put his flesh in her. He's going to put his spirit and his, his blood, as it were, the life is in the blood, his life in there. And then, but see, that's what they're doing. They're saying, we want to be used of God. We want to do ministry. We want to do, they might even say, we want to do your ministry. We want to do things that glorify you. Okay. Okay. The way we use glorify is not the same way that the Bible uses it. And, and that's why I tend towards, I want to satisfy you, Father, or the son in relationship to the, to the wife of the lamb. A satisfaction that we will never really understand. Do you, do you all understand that? You know, uh, there might be somebody that has a father that is the most wonderful man in the world and you know, and you you appreciate having a good father, which would be nice. But you know, you appreciate having a good father. Um, but in truth, you as a son can never know the full satisfaction of what the father is feeling, because you're a son. You can't. You can't do it at all. Just like with the wife of the lamb. You know. To satisfy the lamb, what does that mean? You see, we would, we would rather say satisfy the husband. <laughs> but the lamb is going to be a lamb. And he's always going to be a lamb. And eternally he's going to be a lamb. A slaughtered lamb. So how does she satisfy that? Well, by fulfilling the true meaning. Does that make sense? The true meaning of wife towards husband and the true meaning of wife towards husband who is slain lamb. Oh, man. I mean, come on, grasp that just for a minute. But still with that, we'll never understand the full satisfaction. Probably the best thing we could do is find out from him if this satisfies and if it does then okay but the, but you can't that's not your place your place is different from that all right so what is it this is the work of God that you believe on him whom God sent now this whole argument that's been going on here and will continue is has to do with um, well uh, you know when Moses was in the wilderness uh, God sent bread from heaven to earth. Okay? Does that sound familiar at all? That's exactly what Jesus is, but Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And all that was was a shadow, just a picture, just a, a uh, something to open us up more and more as we see these pictures and these realities to open us up more and more that there is a real and it's similar to this and to be hungry beyond knowing Bible stories you know beyond knowing Bible stories when it's all said and done 
you know, we, we, could, we could pull out all the Bible stories here and we could take it and we could throw it in the trash on one, in one sense, in the way that I'm trying to describe. And go find that from which all of that is just a vague shadow. We could do that. But in the meantime, we need the Word of God, and we need the pictures, and we need to say, Holy Spirit, show me the true meaning of these things instead of, you know, how do I twist this to make it work for me? Because people twist the scriptures to make it work for them. Um, and when they do that, their motivation is to what? Satisfy themselves. Okay. So you don't do that if your heart is like that of Jesus, the Son towards the Father. His Everything he's going to do, all the death that he's going to take, everything has to do with that. Satisfying. You could say pleasing the Father. The Father's good pleasure. All of those things. But it, it, it comes from a heart. I mean, okay, sure. You could have, you know, what if you have an angel over here and the angel did everything that the son did would the father go well that's just as good as Jesus <laughs> why wouldn't it because that's what most people think Christianity is be like be Christ like <laughs> but that's not it it needs to be Christ it needs to be this life and here in this pomegranate son is the true picture of how that's going to happen. So any attempt outside of him, in our own strength, even with our own desires. I mean, I went years going, I love you, Jesus. And I really thought there was something special about the fact that I love Jesus. But, you know, and you say, well, doesn't Jesus want us to love him? Yeah, but not, not with something that's short of the son. In other words, human love. Okay, and when I loved Jesus, it was like all solely, uh, you know, pathos. <laughs> it was. I mean, I was pitiful. But, it, but I honestly, this is the honest truth, I thought I was spiritual. I mean, I really, I really did. And that doesn't mean I don't cry to this day. I still do. I may cry before these two classes are over. But it's not based on soul. It's, it's based on a reality of the son that brings forth whatever he wants to. If we're his body, he should be able to let tears run down him if he wants to. <laughs> right? That's not, that's not our business. But when we make it us, it's our business. So we go, okay, well, what are the things, what are the things that will please God and really look good to the church? <laughs> okay. Crying, carrying on. Oh, Jesus! I, 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 and please do that and cry. I'm not, I'm not trying to take that away from, the, away from you. And I'm not questioning. I don't look at you and go, well, that's the soul. You know, I don't, I don't go, I don't, I don't go through all that stuff. I'm pretty much free. You know what I mean? I can be with the Lord, and if you're right on or right off, I'm going to go right on, you know, uh, because my relationship is through the Son to the Father. It's not as, you know, fruit inspector, you know. Well, I'll be your fruit inspector for the day, you know. Um, and, I, and I used to do some of that back in my early pastoral days when I was not a shepherd but a fruit inspector. All right, so this is the work of God. And folks, until we get that down, there's no need for moving on. This is the work of God, that you believe on this broken bread, this poured out life, this broken body, and you believe that to be the way, the truth, and the life. That's, that's, the, can you see, it would be ridiculous if an, even an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel let him be, what is it? Let him be, no, I'm asking. Anathema. An anathema, which means designated, devoted to death, the death of the cross. 
if you hadn't gone through the cross yet, then you need to be cursed. You need to go through the cross. See, ultimately, Paul isn't just, well, you know, you're all cursed. Forget it. There ain't no hope for any of you except a few of us. Because we know the Lord. We know him deep. And that's special to God. He looks at us with smiles. <laughs> yes. Like, when you're giving an example of, like, what if an angel came and did all the things that, that Jesus did? It made me think, like, if I walked into someone else's house and, like, was very polite at the dinner table and cleaned the house and fixed it and it was really nice and just extremely pleasant in every way, they would still be like, who are you and why are you in my house? Right. Like, you're not my son. You know, you're not related to me. Like, even in the earth, if somebody walked into someone else's family and tried to be a really good son, it's still not the same thing. It's still like, even if they're better behaved than your natural children, it's like, can you get out of our house when you're not related to us? You're not, you're not a part of this, you know what I mean? Like, it would be like that. It would be like somebody walking into the Holy of Holies and trying to be really, and it's just like, I don't care, even if you're doing all the actions, like, you're not, my, you're not my son. I'm the father. I want my son. I don't want a well-behaved stranger. If you don't remember anything else out of this class, remember that. You. <laughs> because that. Okay. Yeah, I, while you were saying that, I pictured us going into the Holy of Holies, you know, and, you know, and we think, oh, I'm a priest. I'm looking so good. And the Lord, we're like dressed in a clown suit. <laughs> on this stuff and he's going get out of here <laughs> but see we don't see correctly do we yes uh, I was just thinking about uh, Jesus says that broken bread broken body but that's not an action that we try to come to but that's just showing Jesus' heart for the father right mm -hmm. Okay, so, so broken bread, we're, we're about to move into the flesh and that sort of stuff, but broken bread is what we've been dealing with up to this point. And um, we, we must not, like I've done everything up to this point, we must not mistake that for the Savior. This is what he was sent as to us, to eat. Okay, this is life within this is the kind of life within. This is the, the definition. Broken bread is the definition of the life to put in us and allow it to live, to spread. Okay? So, um, keeping your place here. Well, we're only one page over. Now, let's look again at uh, verse 53. And we're going to go through 57. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. There it is. Did that just say what I just said? This is the life that he wants in you. This isn't, this isn't the Savior, broken bread so you won't go to hell. No, broken bread so that you can be able to assimilate it into your being. See, Jesus, the Son of God, came down in a form that could be taken into us and become part of us, assimilated into our being, okay? So, um, so unless you, you know, except you eat this, except you eat what? He says what it is. My flesh and drink my blood, this is all poured out stuff so the father would get sons, so it would satisfy the father so that it would bring you into something that you don't deserve. Oh, okay, let's, let's, let's look at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay, so here they are, everything's good, but everything's not perfect, is it? It's all good, but it's not perfect. Um, there's a snake in there. Uh, when he finished, you know, you got to remember that on the sixth day when he finished, Eve wasn't around on the seventh day when he finished. And I, I even took this so far as to go on the, you know, God rested on the seventh day. Is that the day Adam and Eve sinned? 
because it happened after creation. I mean, I'm just going, you know, my mind just rolling and everything, but I'm just, I'm just thinking along those lines. But so they sin. So what would restoration look like? Okay. Um, uh, let's just be honest. Okay, a, a really beautiful garden with a snake in it. <laughs> I mean, being restored to what you had before. Or, or being restored to God in that you were Adam and you sinned and you became the bane of the universe. <laughs> and, and now I'm going to accept you. Well, well, how, you know, I'm going to forgive you. How about that? Or I'm going to make, you know, you can't make them, you can't make any of us innocent. You do realize, don't you? You can't make us innocent. We did something wrong, right? <laughs> you know, you can forgive it, but forgiveness doesn't make you innocent. It just means you did it and you were forgiven. But he does something completely above and beyond that in that he brings us in son and in union with the son as the son, and not that we're the son, but the son is in us. And our relationship is not Adam and Eve in a nice garden and he comes down and visits in the cool of the evening. We are one with the son and therefore that oneness is described by Jesus in John 17. Uh, uh, the father in me and I in the father. Even so, Father, that that might be I and them and they and me. Okay? Do you see how oneness works? Oneness is more than a give and take. It is more than a give and take. It is more than forgiveness. It is more than restoring. Restoring means bringing back to the state that it was before it failed. This relationship is so far beyond restoring something, you know? This is restoration, church. That's fine. Get us to that point, but then bring us on. Amen. You know, I mean, I, I don't put that down because certain aspects of that are needed. And, you know, and all of us came through trails of that, through different means and things. But this, this is completely different. It is so far above forgiveness and everything else. It is our relationship, and truly our relationship is with the Father and with His Son. See, it's here. It's not us and Him. And so the more we realize that, the more that, that we are changed, I'm going to say it like this, the more we realize, the more we are changed into His flesh, functioning as His body. See, and we, we lose our identity. Can you see how in this, in this relationship, you would lose your earthly identity before, you know, there, I would say that there's even a progression in loss of identity, okay? So you get saved and you say, well, I'm saved, you know, but the person who's saved still needs to go to the cross and, you know, real, or at least re realize the reality of that. And so, so you're saved and you're of God and you're in the family and all this kind of stuff, but then there's the next pro progression, and that is this reality of the cross and everything. And so I'm crucified with Christ. Christ lives in me. Okay. And so if, if we were able to really live that out according to Galatians 2.20, that would be great. But there's something higher than that. There is? Well, I thought that's what we preach. Well, there's a lot of stuff higher than what we preach that we still don't know about. Okay. There, but even raised more, we're brought into something here and in this relationship, which is supposed to be lived in the earth because flesh and manifestation, um, this relationship is eternal. This is not a temporal relationship and this is not a relationship based on forgiveness. Not to this point. I mean, that happened down the road here. You got that. But this relationship, the father... See, you see that with the prodigal son. See? You see that with the prodigal son, okay? So the, the, the prodigal comes back, and the father sees him a long way off, and, and the son's going, I need, to, I, I'm not, well, I need to tell the father. This is what he says in his mind before he sees the father. I need to tell him that, Father, I have sinned, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Okay. 
Folks, that's, that's the sin, not of a sinner, but of, of a son. Right? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Father, I have, he's in the family, been in the family. Okay, so he comes back and he goes, Father, so he, he doesn't know this. He doesn't know this relationship between the father and with the son. And their union, he has only known his union with the father. Can you see that? He's only known his union with the father. Okay, well, the father sees him, and the father, you know, the son thinks, okay, my relationship with the father is going to be based on sin and my failure and forgiveness and all the things that Christianity makes it. Well, the father has a completely different set of eyes. <laughs> he sees you in son. And this son hadn't seen him in son in the sense of he's not the son of, of this lineage. He's the son of the father's love. He's in the son of the father's love. Okay. And the father, that's the only son he really sees anyway. I mean, he sees you in son, but, he, but he's seeing the son, that son. Okay, so the father's looking at him, and he's, and he's going, okay, he's ready to say it, and before he can do it, the father starts kissing him, and the father puts the, the best ring on him, and the best shoes, and the best robe, and the, all of this kind of stuff, and he dresses him up like the highest son of honor. He didn't, get, he didn't have that stuff before. He didn't have that stuff before. And the father goes, okay, it's time that we start relating on another basis. There comes a time when, when God says, look, I'm, I'm tired of you. You know, you go, but, but I'm a Christian and I love you. And he says, stop it. I'm sick of your love and your Christianity. I just, because this isn't Christianity. This was before the beginning of the world. I'm sorry, but it's not. This is the father and the son. So, so the father does all of that and starts treating him that way. We talked about this in one of the other classes, but, you know, he brings him in and he kills the fatted calf, which relates to the sweet savor offerings, not the sin offering. And, and there, here, see, here's your death. I want you to see it. I want to take you through it. Over here, let's kill this thing and let's put it to death and let's eat this, la this nature. And it, it was the nature of self-giving. It always is, whether it's a bullock, which it means a calf or a... Uh, a lamb or whatever, turtle dove, it all relates to Christ. But this is, this is the, the selfless one of this relationship. This is the one who gave himself only for the Father. Now, we realize as you view that from different perspectives, you see all the different angles. But the point of this isn't just that Jesus loves the Father. And he dies for the father. That's not the point. The point of this is what? The point of this is the father wants you on a different basis than everything you've been, no matter how good it's been up to this point. The father wants you on a basis of the son, but see, you say, I've been on the base of the son because I believe I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and I've been trying to live that into the earth. Um, that's, that's really good, particularly in relationship to the wife of the lamb. But this is something, see, the wife of the lamb, the wife of the lamb is something that she was brought into, and she knows it. But this is not something you were brought into that existed before there was a world. Before there was sin, before there was a problem, before there was a world. It's between the Father and the Son. And how are you going to make that leap? You know, even, even you as a son is not enough. And a lot of times, I'll just tell you this, it takes a crisis to get you to the point where you're ready to say yes to some of this stuff. I mean, it takes a crisis. Because we go, I, I'm going to use my experience as an example after this sip. I, I, um, 
you know, I heard things and I went, well, that ain't right. And, you know, I, I had scriptures to prove it, which only the, uh, later the Holy Spirit would show me that that's, you're reading it wrong and all this kind of stuff. And I would stand up for God, but it was a wrong, it was a false God. It was the God of, um, I mean, even if it was the same father, it, we put a wrong image on him. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and I did, I did, over and over, in so many different ways. And so, you know, and my view, and this is, this is God, I'm, I'm telling you, even right, right now, within the last weeks, when I get just a second with the Holy Spirit, um, he, is, he is blowing my mind with this reality. We talked about it in the long grace class in the book of Revelation about the bride coming down. But I, I'm seeing that it's more powerful than what we imagine. That she will, and, and she will be brought into something that is uh, more akin to this, but this is what we're talking about right now, so I don't want to get off too much on that. But, but in this relationship, that prodigal son has to enter into a crisis that shakes him. Let's assume that the prodigal son, when he left, figured he was going to do good for the father. Give me now the things that belong to me. <laughs> so wrong. So not this union. The father gave up, I mean, the son gave up everything for the father. Uh, and he, he probably thought that he was really going to be good at what he's doing. I'm going to go do some stuff. I mean, you know, it's going to be, I'm going to grow up. How about this one? I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be mature. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some great things for the Father. Well, what is the work of God? To believe on this broken bread, this poured out, this is it. You got to get there first, son. You, got, you don't even know what spirit you're of. You know, so he goes out and it all goes bad. And now you got a Jew feeding pigs. Well, that's rough. <laughs> that's bad. That's real bad. Not only that, but he's eating pig food. Well, yeah, of course he is. He's not eating the flesh of the Son of God or drinking his blood. He's not. He's eating stuff from uncleanness. And he doesn't understand the process. So that's why the father says, we're going to feast, but we're going to feast on this thing that we're going to kill, crucify, and we're going to, this is going to be our life now. Yes. And this is what we're going to call a feast. Amen. And the son's going, well, by the way, would you forgive me? Said, just shut up, kid. <laughs> you know? Just can't, we're going to enter into something where forgiveness is no longer an issue, see? But we're always, well, uh, you know, always, but you'll think bad of me if you knew really how bad I am. You don't think the Father knows how bad you are? You know? But it doesn't matter to him. Why? Because, because that's you out here. And he doesn't see you there. Oh, Father, forgive me, and I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. I know, you're not. That's what I put you in, son, and that's even better than you being called a son. And this is your identity. Eat it. Amen. <laughs> All right. We need to stop. Good timing. <laughs>